Contact Simulations recently sent me these just released PC only FR Tech budget HOTAS Raptor systems. The Mac One Raptor joystick and throttle can be purchased together in a bundle pack at the price of just £150, which puts it into the same ballpark figure as Thrustmaster's T1600M FCS HOTAS, which is slightly cheaper at £135. Or perhaps the Thrustmaster TTA Officer Pack Airbus Edition, which is a little more bespoke perhaps and retails at £150. Of course, Honeycomb are soon to release their own hot ass system, and I would expect for that to also be placed within this ballpark figure. I've never owned a T1600 FM, but I do have the TCA Officer Pack for comparison, and I will be utilising that opportunity later in the review. I have heard from many of you out there that the TCA Officer Pack both looks and feels almost identical to the T1600FM, so that might be a good indication of a comparison there. The second joystick that I am reviewing as part of this review today is the Raptor Mac 2 joystick. That will cost just under £115 and can only be purchased separately, but it can be used alongside any throttle, including the Raptor throttle, which will retail at just under £50 itself. When I first saw the Mac 2, I immediately noticed, and many of you have expressed the same, just how similar it is to the VKB Gladiator, a joystick which is now completely discontinued by VKB, who, it has to be said, appear to have moved on to vastly more exciting pastures. The VKB Gladiator, when in stock, retailed at just £78, a significant difference to the Raptor then at £115 with change. So what similarities are there between the two and what differences perhaps justify that price tag margin? In addition to answering these questions, I will also briefly cover the following, the design and build quality of all the devices, game compatibility setup and calibration, and comparisons between other similar devices. I'll answer your questions that you placed before I made this review and then I will conclude with my own personal final thoughts. The Raptor range is a budget range, and as such, despite the base of the joystick being made out of metal, 90% of it is a lightweight polyplastic, with the main shaft, button switches and the handles all made from the same sturdy lightweight polyplastic. Both joysticks offer pre-drilled holes in order to permanently fix them to a base, but even without this, they are stable and secure, thanks to their size and weight. Despite the Mac 1 having a vastly larger and heavier base than the Mac 2, neither joystick moved about during play, thanks to the grippy silicon feet on the bottom. The overall ergonomic design is very good on both of the sticks, but the Mac 2, with its slightly turned in position, does feel ever so slightly more comfortable in the hand. For some, that might actually feel a little bit awkward to start with, but I'll be honest, it quickly feels quite natural. Both joysticks are definitely designed for right-handed players though, but the grip and the action for the throttle on the joysticks is good, with a comfy hand and finger rest available where needed. Theoretically, of course, you could use this in Southpaw, but it really isn't designed for that position. The shifter mode systems are a little different from the norm, with the shifter button located on the front shaft, which has to be held down in order to accommodate variations. Now, it only took a few flights for me to get used to it, and the combination of the mode and switch shift buttons officially provides the Mac 1 with 32 programmable actions and the Mac 2 with 29. But when utilising the multiple hat switch combinations as shifters as well, theoretically I suspect you could double bind buttons to your heart's content. Now this might get a little bit complicated quickly, especially for fully simulated aircraft systems like in DCS, but equally I found it to be very useful and strangely intuitive in a very short space of time. So it really does work pretty well. The buttons on both devices feel to be on the cheaper side of premium, but they do offer good and solid connections with immediate, clean and responsive input for every single button. And whilst the safety fire switches are a bit gimmicky, they do also work pretty well as well. The action on the throttle and indeed the throttle action on both of the joysticks are very smooth and precise, but the throttle itself has a noteworthy smooth action on it. Much better, let's say, than the Logitech X56 Rhino systems that I have here already. With the tensioning bar system on the side, you can adjust the level of resistance, not by much, it has to be said, but no matter what tension level you set it to, it retains it, and that nice smooth throttle action is also consistent throughout, which is very helpful when you're trying to make small adjustments on final. 
I tested both joysticks in every game that I played and in, and in every situation. Although the Mac 2 felt a smidge better in each department, there was very little, if any, noticeable difference in terms of performance, handling or precision in game itself. I picked at random a landing challenge in Microsoft Flight Simulator that I've never tried before and then attempted to set what I considered to be a reasonable score. I was surprised at just how close the two scores actually were in the end, despite which joystick I used. The throttle like the joysticks does not feel like a premium build, with its cheap but effective buttons and its lightweight plastic frame, but like both joysticks it holds its position well, even when set to maximum torsion. It doesn't move about on the desk at all. The least impressive element of the throttle has to be the rotating dials. Whilst seemingly actually precise in game, they do feel very cheap when you use them. The joystick's yaw axis has an issue too, with far less accuracy and a pretty big dead zone, making it feel a little bit hit and miss sometimes. So every game that I threw at these devices immediately recognised them, and despite some odd naming conventions, each game understood and accurately responded to each and every input that I placed. Even when combining the shift button combinations, uh, it worked perfectly in Microsoft Flight Simulator, Elite Dangerous, DCS World, IL-2 Stemovic, and even with older titles like Rise of Flight, they just worked perfectly. The precision of the joysticks seem okay in each of these titles as well. An element of Dead Zone certainly does exist, and I will show you this in detail shortly, and I needed to learn to adjust for that, but it didn't take me long, and once I did, I did find both sticks to be perfectly functional, if a little bit on the lightweight side of things. Yes indeed, the lack of strength on the joystick centralising spring can be considered to be both a positive and a negative. For example, long flights in biplanes require you to hold your aircraft straight and level for a long period of time, and with a stronger spring, it can get tiring. A weaker spring then puts less stress on your forearm muscles and is more comfortable in the long run. However, on the flip side, it can also impact against you on final when trying to make smaller precision adjustments. The lack of resistance can cause you sometimes to overcompensate, and I dare say that given enough time and practice, your muscle memory would negate this issue, but in the short amount of time that I have had them for testing, these are the two most glaring opposing observations. Now, calibration is certainly an area that needs some attention, and before I start, I want to let you know that I contacted Contact Simulations in order to ask about the noise that I was seeing on the Mac 2 joystick when centralised. They confirmed that this was not normal behaviour, and they sent me a second device to compare. Now, I can confirm that the level of noise on the second Mac 2 is 99.9% .9 less than it was on the original, but on occasions, there is still a very tiny amount of movement, a tiny amount of noise which is still seemingly being detected say 50% of the time. Now, in either device, it's not enough to disengage autopilot, nor is it going to make landing particularly difficult on either of these devices, but there certainly is a little something there going on on both devices. So, if your Mac 2 has a lot of noise, then I recommend that you also contact support and see what they can do. Now, calibration for the Mac 1 and the throttle are very straightforward. Plug them in, open the settings menu, and follow the calibration guide. Everything seemed to operate and work as expected. The Mac 2, which did initially have that noise issue, but also one of the most confusing calibration routines for any device that I have owned, and I own quite a few. In order to get into the official calibration mode following the leaflet that comes with the device, you need to press and hold the mode button before plugging it in to the computer. This will allow your PC to recognize the device under a different name and the axis layout will also be different when that happens. Now, I can only recommend that you attempt to follow the setup calibration procedure if you can, because I could not find the axis for this at all, nor did the throttle axis appear to exist under this setup guise at all either. Both very strange and confusing systems. Now, if you finalize and save as best you can, and then try and recalibrate a second time, so take the USB out and put it back in again, that's without going into calibration mode, all of the axes will seemingly then be available for configuration. So honestly, I'm not sure what's going on there. If anything, at best, it just seems a little bit broken, although I don't think it is. It's just odd the way that it's asking you to set it up. And to be honest with you, I can't quite fathom what is actually going on there. 
Furthermore, I tried to download the VKB Gladiator software package as a test out of curiosity. Sadly, it didn't detect the Raptor, but it's something that I might look at again in the future. So back in the day, VKB released the Gladiator Mark II World War II KG-12 grip replica. It was used in aircraft such as the Messerschmitt Bf 109 and the Focke-Wulf FW-190. And yes, the Raptor Mac II looks very similar. Actually, but for the logo styling, they are identical. However, the Gladiator is now a discontinued branch of the VKB range. You cannot buy these new anymore. When they were available, they would retail at about £78. Furthermore, they were accompanied with some very powerful software and pretty well received by all those who owned one. I had a friend who owned one and he too was extremely positive about the Gladiator. Now, I cannot compare the feel of the two as I've never owned a Gladiator myself, but I can try and at least compare the inner components and try and understand what differences exist, if any. Now, I believe that both devices' throttle axes are still using a potentiometer. It just feels that that is what is implemented there. But, despite asking uh, contact simulations and trying to research both devices as much as I can, I can neither confirm or deny if the Raptor is using VKB's Mars sensors or a Hall sensor, perhaps even using something else entirely. The Raptor just states that they are using an electromagnetic technology for smooth, precise movement and reliability, alongside a powerful 32-bit ARM chip which gives increased sensitivity and functionality. Now, traditionally, the VKB products use the effect of magnetic resistance instead of the Hall effect. VKB calls their contactless sensor solution MARS, MARS, Magneto-Resistive Sensors. Now, both magneto-resistive sensors and whole effective sensors detect magnetic field strength, but the magneto-resistive sensors have much higher sensitivity than whole effect sensors and much lower hysteresis. This is like a momentary lag when the magnet is removed from the field. It takes a little while for the whole effect sensor to pick up on that. A magneto-resistive device's sensitivity is also adjustable with software, and I don't believe that whole sensors are. Now, VKB controllers with Mars sensors can be adjusted for resolution of up to 15 bits via the VKB dev config configuration software, which I have downloaded and I'm yet to see if it will connect to and work with the Raptor. But that could definitely change things in the long run. So in order to compare the two with my Thrustmaster TCA flight pack, which is not intended for combat flight simulation and as such is much more of a bespoke kit, so comparison can only go so far. That being said, many people comment on how similar the joystick here is with the T1600M, so hopefully that will give you some indication of a comparison on that front. They both utilise a lot of plastic in their build and both of the throttles have an excellent action on them. I vastly prefer the throttle on the Raptor joystick than the one on the Thrustmaster, but I like the feel of the joystick on the Thrustmaster joystick more, and it has the added ability of being configurable for both left and right handed players. Of course, the Raptor joystick supports a significant number of extra button combos and opportunities as a combat hot ass. Uh, in that regard, there is absolutely no comparison. The joystick spring is much tighter on the Thrustmaster than it is on the Raptor, and the overall feel of smooth input and control has to go to the Thrustmaster, but not by a significant margin. Indeed, it could just be attributed to the fact that I am more familiar with it, and as such it feels nicer in my hand. But there is also a faint noise which emanates from the Raptors that is simply not present in the Thrustmaster. Now I dare say it's too low a noise for to, to be successfully captured for this video, but a small noise there is nonetheless. So one of the questions that I was asked was to uh, clarify what the inflection parameters from 0 to N were on the Raptor joysticks, and I can say that there are 4096 steps on three of the four axes available. No confirmation, unfortunately, but I guess, based on what I've used, that it is the X, Y and throttle axes which have 4096 steps, and it is the yaw which seems to be far less precise, at least in my experiments. So my final thoughts then on these devices. There are a few things which I don't feel that I have been able to answer sufficiently. What type of magnetic sensors are actually being used in either of these devices? If you happen to know, then I would love to know, so please do let me know in the comments. Despite any of the issues highlighted in this review, what really matters is what they are like to use in-game, and on that front, I must say that I really didn't have any issues with any of the Raptor devices at all. 
I like the buttons and the throttle action, and once you get used to the multi-mode and shift button operated control system, that is also a very capable device, and overall, it's a very capable stick. Some of the areas I would have deemed unacceptable, like buttons that fire inconsistently or lack of smooth and accurate axie input, have not been an issue in my investigations, and once in-game everything feels and responds exactly as I hoped they would. The distinct similarities to the VKB Gladiator could potentially be an indication that the build quality design and implementation actually come from a well-tested and widely appreciated source. Again, if you have a Gladiator 2 and can draw some test comparisons, I would love to hear about that in the comments as well. I think the Raptors are a perfectly adequate budget option for those with a keen interest in combat fighting. Something more bespoke like the Thrustmaster TCA pack would better suit those looking to fly jets, I think, but would leave you short on button options for anything else, of course. The real potential competitor to the Raptors is the Thrustmaster T16000M and potentially the Honeycomb when it finally releases its Hotas later in 2022. Now, personally, I think I'd like to keep an eye on the price of these new devices as my hunch is that they might well need to move towards the same price or the same cost as that of the T1600Ms in order to remain competitive with them. That being said, who's to say that Thrustmaster won't put their prices up? If you're just getting into flight simulation, the other key consideration is, of course, whether or not you want it to be Xbox compatible. For that, you will definitely, definitely need to wait for the Honeycomb system to arrive. But if you want something right now that will work pretty much as expected straight out of the box on just your PC, then I've got to say there are far worse HOTAS systems available at higher prices. Yes, Logitech, I am looking at you. The Raptor system and the combinations that you can get here will definitely give you a reasonable starter pack, uh, allowing you to fly combat and general aviation flights with enough button combos to keep you going for quite some time. If you have any further questions or input, I'd love to hear it in the comment section. Don't forget to hit the like button if this review was helpful for you. I thank you so much for your time and I look forward to making another re review for you in the near future. Thanks for watching. Take care. Goodbye for now.